Good morning to our viewers in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Europe. I'm Paula Dobriansky. I'm on the Atlantic Council Board and I'm also Vice Chair of the Scowcroft Centers for Strategy and Security. I am really delighted to welcome you to the public launch of the Atlantic Council's Task Force Report, Digitalization in Central and Eastern Europe, Building Regional Cooperation. This report comes at a crucial time for the region of Central and Eastern Europe. The COVID-19 pandemic is dramatically altering the global landscape, as we know, and accelerating reliance on technology. Our current crisis gives new momentum to the debate on digitalization. Businesses and governments are demanding digital solutions to manage the crisis. Governments are counting on digital innovators to effectively track and trace coronavirus to slow the virus's spread. Meanwhile, businesses are adapting their operations to the new environment, relying on virtual communication methods to maximize operational continuity. Central and Eastern Europe is primed to succeed. The strong foundation is digital infrastructure, STEM talent pools, a vibrant ecosystem, and lack of legacy industries can propel regional growth despite current challenges. Equipped with these pre-existing fundamentals, the COVID-19 crisis offers an opening and an opportunity for Central and Eastern Europe to build, shape, and drive its economic recovery through digitalization. At the same time, broader geopolitical dynamics influence Central and Eastern Europeans' digital priorities. The return of great power competition is playing out across the region, especially in the arena of digital technology. As we know, China attempts to influence Central and Eastern Europe through expansive investments, which have come into much sharper focus. The region's 5G network infrastructure has been a central focus as countries formally commit to protecting 5G networks from security risks. But 5G is just one component of this discussion. Broader questions loom about the impact of emerging technologies, such as AI, control over the development and application of new technologies will be key in deterring who sets the global rules and standards for digital innovations and who benefits. Now for Central and Eastern Europe, leveraging digitalization is not purely an economic policy challenge. It is also a matter of national security, geopolitical resilience and strategic relevance. In this context, the Atlantic Council convened a task force of US and Central and East European digital innovators, experts, and thought leaders. I was honored to co-chair this effort alongside of my colleague, Mashe Vitutsky, CEO of Leviathan. Our task force sought to move beyond generalities about digitalization in Central and Eastern Europe. We identified concrete policies and priorities that will move forward digitalization and help the region seize its full potential. Increased cooperation across Central and Eastern Europe is essential to leverage regional strengths and overcome regional challenges. The task force honed in on the benefits of collaboration, exploring opportunities to share best practices, to learn from neighbors and build upon the region's success stories. Robust regional cooperation will not only enhance Central and Eastern Europe's digital potential, it will truly also benefit Europe as a whole and strengthen the transatlantic relationship. The debate over Europe's digital future is in full swing. As the countries of Central and Eastern Europe chart their path forward on digital technologies and policy priorities, a common position will amplify the region's voice in Brussels. The region brings an important perspective to these EU discussions and should play a much more proactive role in shaping the EU's digital future. If the region can drive forward its digital progress 
and build coalitions on digital policy matters at the EU level. This will mitigate some of the digital policy differences that have plagued transatlantic relations in recent years and strengthen the partnership between Central and Eastern Europe and the United States. Now, how should Central uh, and Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, boost regional cooperation on digitalization? Our task force identified the Three Cs Initiative as an important regional framework to galvanize digital projects and policy actions. The Three Cs Initiative is a powerful forum for the region and has gained significant momentum with the creation of the Three Cs Investment Fund. The digital pillar of the initiative, dedicated to enhancing cross-border digital infrastructure and interconnectivity, is key to greater regional cooperation, but remains largely underdeveloped compared to the energy and transportation pillars of the Three Cs initiative. With Estonia a digital forerunner, hosting the recent Three Cs Summit on October 19. The task force was very pleased to present its report and recommendations ahead of the virtual summit. We look forward to working with Bulgaria throughout their presidency of the Three Cs Initiative to continue our effort to elevate these discussions on digitalization within the Three Cs context. Now I'm going to turn it over to our presenter but I first have to mention that, unfortunately, my co-chair of the task force, Mashe Vitutsky, regrettably had to be called away. But it does give me great pleasure to introduce a fellow colleague, Jorn Fleck, who is Associate Director of the Atlantic Council's Future Europe Initiative, and who also was one of the rapporteurs on the report. Jorn, over to you, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Dobriansky, uh, for, for your leadership on the task force and for your great scene setting remarks to describe the broader context for this task force report. Uh, and especially the combination that you outlined that I think was unique to this task force of both the technological and economic aspects, but then also the geopolitical um, and national security considerations of digitalization in Central and Eastern Europe. And, and what regional cooperation can bring to that. As introduced, my name is Jorn Fleck. I had the honor of serving as rapporteur for the task force with my colleague Eileen Kennengeiser on the Atlantic Council's Future Europe Initiative. I have the unenviable task of outlining the task force reports, 40 page report and recommendations for digitalization in Central and Eastern Europe uh, in just a few minutes, otherwise, Fran will, will uh, go after me. Um, before I begin though, let me just thank again our outstanding task force members for their ideas, energy, and especially the time they devoted to shaping this, this timely report. We're also grateful to the wide range of external stakeholders from the, uh, from the private sector, civil society, and government who engaged with us from across the region in this effort and contributed their insights and expertise to this effort. In our virtual task force effort, we, we approached digitalization in, in Central and Eastern Europe on the basis of three broad starting points. First, digitalization can become a game changer for the region's economic model, which we saw even before the, the current COVID-19 crisis was showing some signs of strain. Across countries, sectors and technologies, digital transformations are leveling the playing field and are fundamentally changing the way companies do business, governments provide services to their citizens, and all of us work and connect with each other and consume services and, and order our goods online. That can create new openings for, for countries and sectors to leapfrog ahead and overcome some of the challenges uh, facing, facing the region. In attempting to make the most of such new opportunities, Central and Eastern Europe can draw on several strengths uh, that, that Ambassador Dobriansky hinted at. Strong foundations for digital development, like strong digital infrastructure, and the region's uh, education sectors, especially in the STEM area. 
significant process in the expansion of digital access and infrastructure and real success stories also at the company level, both at unicorn level, but also be below that for, for rising stars across sectors of digital excellence and innovation. Second, the current COVID-19 pandemic and its accompanying economic crisis is accelerating digital transformation and every crisis offers opportunities. As the report indicates, we are already seeing uh, wider use and greater adoption of digital services, digital technologies and their applications by, by consumers and citizens, by governments, uh, by small and large businesses. Those who leverage these changes we are seeing and successfully consolidate temporary gains during the crisis into longer term advantages stand a good chance of emerging from the current economic disruption stronger and more competitive. And that applies both at the country, but also at the company level. At the same time, the crisis reminds us that these shocks exacerbate existing disparities. Persistent urban rural divides, varying levels of digital skills and technology adoption, and the, the brain drain among Central and Eastern Europe's tech talent are direct challenges to the region's ability to make the most of digitalization across economies and societies writ large. Which leads me to the third starting point. Central and Eastern Europe's strong fundamentals and its digital performance during the pandemic will not automatically translate into innovative tech leadership, dynamic eco economic growth, or greater competitiveness for the region. Wider adoption of digital solutions alone does not equal digital transformation. If the region is to leverage digitalization to fuel economic recovery and overcome some of its own limitations, there seem to be few alternatives to working together at a regional level, which is really the key takeaway for, from our task force effort. In other words, these regional challenges demand regional solutions. To help push Forward Central and Eastern Europe's digital transformation, the task force identified a set of principles and recommendations to help guide and galvanize regional priorities and policy action. Competition set, excuse me, several themes emerged from our discussions. First, Central and Eastern Europe must develop an ecosystem that encourages digital innovation and fosters cross-border co collaboration. Competition has its role to play, no question. But to achieve greater competitiveness, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe should build clusters focused on specific technologies and applications that align with their existing digital strengths and priorities. These hubs could build on individual country specialties and connect these across the region. Just imagine what a combination of data management from Bulgaria, fintech from Lithuania, digital education, experience and expertise in Poland and blockchain innovation in Slovenia could achieve together. In parallel with these clusters, governments in Central and Eastern Europe should build out programs in existing universities to focus on the practical applications of digital technology trends. These programs can bridge education and the private sector to create talent pipelines and continuously upskill and reskill the region's workforce. And digital public services and e-government can play an enabling role in advancing digital adoption and technology diffusion to small and medium-sized businesses in particular. Greater cooperation on cross-border services can also drive regional solutions and trade and innovation. Our second set of recommendations is focused on building the infrastructure to facilitate regional cooperation across CE. A key takeaway from our exchanges with policymakers around the region was the lack of a consistent forum dedicated to digital issues. But effective cooperation can only emerge from regular and structured consultations and exchanges. As a result, the task force recommends the creation of a digital council incorporated into the three C's initiative. With the three C's existing digital pillar, a digital council would encourage Central and Eastern Europe's leaders and government officials to discuss priorities, share back best practices, and develop a common way forward. 
In a similar vein, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe should convene a group of private and public sector CIOs and CTOs to produce an annual report identifying critical obstacles and bottlenecks for digitalization in the region. Their recommendations can feed into the 3C Summit and Digital Council and can help inform the priorities of policymakers for regional cooperation. In order to advance regional efforts on digitalization, resources are essential to translate ambitions into action. This underpins our third set of recommendations for Central and Eastern Europe. With the anticipated influx of funding provided by next gen generation EU funding, Central and Eastern Europe has a unique opportunity to channel additional funds into transformative digital projects. To maximize the region's return, our investment, uh, return on investment, excuse me, we recommend that governments across the region compare and coordinate plans for spending the EU's COVID-19 recovery funds allocated for digitalization. A portion of these funds could be applied towards a shared project such as cross-border services or high-performance computing. Governments across the region should, should also set aside 1% of the next EU next generation funds intended for digital transformation in order to support much needed regional cooperation efforts. Our final set of recommendations promotes priorities to strengthen Central and Eastern Europe's voice in Brussels and in Washington. As Ambassador Dobriansky stressed, the debate over digital policies and initiative is already underway in Brussels. Central and Eastern Europe must be ready to weigh in on the debate and offer alternatives as needed. But the region will only be heard if it speaks in unison. Central and Eastern Europe should leverage the three C's digital council that we propose to define and drive its digital agenda within the EU. The region should also play a vital role in pushing for greater cooperation between the United States and the European Union especially in establishing digital standards. Through its unique perspective, Central and Eastern Europe can bridge the divide between Brussels and Washington to ensure shared transatlantic values and the creation of global rules on digital issues. To conclude, I will come back to some of the starting points I mentioned. We believe that a more concerted, intentional effort at regional cooperation on digitalization is the way forward. One that leverages the best of Central and Eastern Europe digital diversity and existing co competition. By bringing together the talent and innovation the region has, we can shape common solutions, drive standards of excellence, and create an ecosystem that helps all of Central and Eastern Europe get to the next level of growth, innovation, and prosperity through digital transformation. By becoming leading digital innovators, Central and Eastern Europe can also play a key role as digital influencers shaping the EU's approach to emerging technologies, innovation, and competitiveness. With that, let me turn over to the task force and Fran Burwell to discuss these issues in greater detail. Fran, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Jorn. Uh, I'm Fran Burwell. I'm a distinguished fellow here at the Atlantic Council and had the honor of serving on this task force. Um, I'm going to welcome some good colleagues from the task force now to discuss the report in greater detail. And we really have an excellent uh, panel. Um, we have first uh, Gurgana Pasi, who is a digital champion of Bulgaria and president of the Digital National Alliance. She is also a former minister of EU affairs and a former deputy foreign minister. Uh, she has long experience in EU policymaking from the national level, which is a, an excellent perspective for this discussion. Uh, including on digital issues and was centrally involved in the effort, <clears throat> excuse me, to create a pan-European standard for uh, phone chargers. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, something that I think many European consumers appreciate very much. Uh, we also have Ziga Turk, currently a professor of construction informatics at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. He has been twice a minister in the government of Slovenia first as Minister of Education and then as Minister for Growth, two key subjects for this discussion. He also served as Secretary General of the Reflection Group on the Future of Europe. And we also have Remantis Gilius, uh, who is the founder of the European Public Policy Institute in Lithuania. He's a former Minister of Economy of that country and has worked extensively as well in the private sector, including serving on the boards of some cybersecurity 
companies. Uh, I'm actually going to start with um, Minister Gilles uh, Romantis um, and ask why this, why focus on the region? What strengths does the region, in your view, bring to the success uh, with emerging technologies? What, what does it already have that would help in that way? And what do the countries and governments need to do to move forward towards that success? Thank you, Fran. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for opportunity participating both in the task force and uh, in this panel. And definitely, you are not starting from an easy question. Uh, so, I would say uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, answers to the question why is the motivation. And the motivation of the region is very clear. After the joining to European Union, these countries of this region still has some catch up to do in order to <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, to be in uh, on the same line with the our uh, older uh, counterparts. So I would say uh, these countries are still searching for their sustainable competitive edge, and this is one of the biggest reasons, uh, biggest answers to question why. The other uh, answer is that during well, uh, this collapse of Soviet regime. Uh, these countries has built a sustainable or um, uh, very firm background for jumping to the next level. So what was um, already mentioned by Jorn, that uh, there's a great educational background, infrastructure with the support of European Union. We built uh, uh, a good background where uh, this step to take a lead in some of the technologies seems uh, a viable option. And the current situation in emerging technologies provides this, I would say, pretty unique opportunity for the region countries to take a lead. And here comes together green agenda, digitization, artificial intelligence, all in one pool. And uh, But answering, so what we can do about it, sadly, I don't have a silver bullet answer because the, uh, there's no single decision, single right decision or single right policies that needs to be taken. There's a whole pool of synchronized things like regulatory decisions, innovation and incentivization of innovation, synchronized investments, developing strategic demand, uh, cross-border policies, all this has to be made in a kind of right, uh, right decisions made for a long time in order to achieve this, uh, to seize these opportunities. And to my understanding, 3Cs region, what we were discussing in the, during the preparation of the report, has a huge value in making this possible to uh, kind of write policies and sustaining them. Uh, so kind of making the efforts and sustaining them. Uh, and uh, I would say what is uh, really one of the biggest takes that I, I bring from the report is that we discuss cross-border cooperation, regional cooperation as a source of innovation, source of strength not a burden of dealing with our neighbors, but uh, something that creates really bigger value that we cannot achieve in uh, by single country policies. So that's probably my short answer. And so for bigger answers, you will need to uh, guide our uh, listeners to read the report. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much, Renatus. I want to actually invite our listeners to go to the Q&A function. Uh, we're going, I'm going to have a short discussion here with the other pan with panelists, and then we very much want to hear your questions and comments. So uh, please go to the Q&A section and, and type your question in. Uh, let me turn now to Minister Passi. And uh, Romantis mentioned that 
cross-border cooperation should be seen as a source of strength and innovation, not just a burden on uh, with neighbors. Uh, and I think I want to try and bring this down to a more specific level. Uh, we talked a lot in the task force about specific projects and examples, and I wonder if uh, you could talk a little bit more about your experience uh, and the uh, and some specific areas of cooperation that you have seen that have worked well. Oh, thank you, Fran. Uh, thank you indeed for this very, very timely discussion and report. Uh, I, I, I'm absolutely convinced that in times of such geopolitical rivalry, as well as uh, all the pandemic uncertainty we have around us, cooperation is the, the way forward. That's why uh, I, I mean it when I say that uh, the, the outcome of this uh, task force, the report we are releasing today, is a really very useful and timely uh, effort. And I think it, will, it might um, uh, serve as a source of inspiration for all the policymakers in the region. Of course, we, we discussed at length that um, it is difficult to trigger real cooperation. And at least up to now, we don't see uh, signs of real cooperation on the digital domain. But uh, in my personal experience as a Bulgarian European minister some time ago, I must uh, confess that it is not entirely true that the countries from Central and Eastern European uh, Europe have had difficulties in cooperating so far. I still remember the very, very uh, active cooperation, for example, we had uh, on climate energy package back in 2007, when we used to sit together uh, before each European summit and at different levels to discuss our joint position. And it worked pretty well, uh, by the way. Uh, let me mention enlargement policy, for example, uh, a, a policy which uh, we as countries who have been the last to join are very sensitive to. That has always been a, a, a policy where our region uh, had no difficulties uh, to reaching uh, consensus. Um, I would add also the cohesion policy. We have been traditionally part of those group of the cohesion friends, friends of the cohesion policy, along with some other countries like, uh, like Portugal, for example. But all the time, uh, Central and Eastern European countries have been on the same page, so to say. So we are building on something that is already there. What we miss here uh, is the sense of urgency first, and second, our shared values, which would uh, not have any difficulties to be transformed into, into a, a common position of the whole reason, region. Uh, we have very often uh, mentioned the lack of homogeneous uh, development in the different countries in the region, and that's very normal. But we should not always look at this uh, unhomogeneous uh, uh, part of Europe as an obstacle for enhanced cooperation, just the opposite. I think this might also create opportunity for the region because it will help us exchange best practices, exchange expertise across a whole range of technology and actually uh, take really um, uh, uh, inspiration from those who are the best in each of the technologies. I think uh, the Central and Eastern Europe must move quickly to take on a more assertive role in shaping the digital strategy of the EU, especially now when we see that the whole process is in, in, in full swing. We see that uh, uh, the European Commission is, is working on uh, new rules, on e-commerce, on, on platform liability, on cybersecurity standards. Uh, it's working on AI strategy. And, and uh, here we should really uh, uh, play special efforts uh, so that the region as a whole have a larger impact on this. Uh, specifically talking about digital domain, um, personally, uh, I see a huge potential uh, in the Central and Eastern European countries taking the lead in forming coalition. First, obviously, it's a shared interest that we see a truly integrated digital market in the EU. Uh, 
because as, uh, as um, the previous speakers mentioned, that can be a real game changer, not, not only for our um, uh, institutions, uh, decision makers, but mainly for our um, uh, entrepreneurs, for our investors, etc. Uh, second, um, since most of the interpreters in this part of uh, Europe are complaining for the, uh, about the insufficient access to, to, to capital, deepening capital markets uh, and securing more diverse financial instruments also is of, of key importance. Uh, and third, more on a, on a policy level, so to say, on an ideological level, I think our countries, uh, despite our uh, past, uh, we kind of show greater um, uh, resistance or skepticisms uh, towards terms like digital sovereignty, because we have a sensitivity and we really want to see the fine line drawn between the protection of citizens from one side, which is a really a priority for, for any government, uh, but also uh, between uh, pure protectionism. And um, I would like to see much, much louder voice um, for uh, cooperation, uh, if you say for digital autonomy, and not so much for terms like digital sovereignty, which to me sound much of a protectionist uh, attitude, which we would rather escape. Thanks very much, uh, Minister Tassi. Let me turn now to Minister Turk uh, and ask him, you know, we, we're now hearing from your fellow uh, task force members of the need for Central Europe to uh, develop a sustainable competitive edge across the region in its economy, um, but also hearing uh, about the intersection of that effort, not only amongst each other, but also with Europe. And I wonder if uh, you could remark or discuss a bit, as Central Europe tries to develop that sustainable competitive edge, as it tries to close the gap, if you will, with the other members of the EU, um, what kind of regulatory environment is needed uh, and what are the major obstacles that you see as Central Europe tries to move forward, if Central Europe were to try and move forward along where we have talked, where we have outlined? Thank you, Fran. Thank you for the question. Um, also, um, I'd like to thank the, the leaders of this group and the rapporteurs and everybody. It was um, a really an interesting um, exercise. Um, the first thing that one needs to, to take into account is that, yes, maybe it is a little bit funny, you know, to say, oh, here we have this regional cooperation and this region wants to do something together on the internet, because frankly, the internet is, is um, distances don't really matter. So in the baseline of this collaboration, there's, it's not geography, it's, uh, it's history and there are cultural issues, there may be economic issues, uh, Rimantas mentioned we want to close the gap, obviously, with the um, with the rest of Europe. Digital is a major uh, element there. Personally, I work on Industry 4.0, Construction 4.0. You cannot really do anything um, without the digital. Um, and indeed, there are some different historical backgrounds between um, the, the three seas countries, um, the rest of Europe, maybe the rest of the world. And I think the bottom line is that this region does not want to be held back with protectionism, it does not want to be held back with somebody else's um, protection of digital or media champions, which frankly are not champions if they need protection. Um, I think in this region, we wanna push forward the global state of the art and use whatever best tools there currently exist. Um, we believe um, we're not, most of us are not big countries with possible exception of Poland. Um, we can contribute in niches um, these niches um, can be planned by governments, but probably not so. In Slovenia, we planned for AI and we did uh, had some very good results on that. We did not plan for, for blockchain and we also had good results uh, in that one. So I think when it, when it comes to regulation, um, the region strategically needs a free and open internet as we used to know it, you know, in the since the late 1980s. Um, I was actually pioneering in this field and it has been a fantastic 
tool, you know, you could be a nobody, you could be from some um, part of Yugoslavia at that time and um, create a service that would be globally significant or could be globally important. It, it provided an opportunity for everyone. And this was the spirit of the internet um, that some of us still remember. And we want to preserve that. We don't want the internet to be shackled by regulation, by limitations, by protectionism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the likely development is that we will see uh, the internet, we see that already, the internet split into the uh, Chinese internet. And then the question is, uh, what will happen to the rest of it? And um, I think in this region, we are strong advocates that the rest of it should you know, remain as much as uh, it used to be um, in the past. In terms of now even more specific um, European regulation, I think we want a digital single market as deep as possible. I think we would also advocate a digital single transatlantic market because just Europe is simply for the niches that we plan to attack, for the niches we are that are interesting, um, for us um, not big enough. A single coherent approach to intellectual property rights. Um, I think we should also have the self-confidence, you know, this, this whole region together. It's not so small, neither in terms of GDP, nor in terms of population, nor in terms of knowledge. Uh, the confidence to drive, to drive the regulatory agenda, you know, not just to amend it, not just to try to block some of the more kind of statistic, centrally planned, um, limiting uh, ideas, but actually to come forward with, uh, with proposals. Um, and also contribute to common uh, standards um, that, that should be driven by the EU, US um, together. Um, for, for this vision, the common dangers are brain drain, protectionism, and um, what, would, what they call dirigisme. So, so somebody um, pushing things in, in, a, in a predefined directions. About the brain drain, the region should cooperate and with, with brain drain, this geography really makes sense, you know, and develop some innovation hubs, harmonize digital policies, work, to get, uh, work together uh, to keep their own talent. But what is also important is to attract the talent from abroad, you know, to the east of um, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, there are excellent talent pools. And we should, uh, you know, steal a chapter from Richard uh, Florida's playbook. He says, talent tolerance technology, this is what attracts uh, people. Um, and uh, we should be a magnet for talent, European, local, etc. And as I said about protectionism and uh, dirigism, uh, the region should speak with one voice in Brussels. I was a minister twice, as it was mentioned, and uh, I can tell you it is possible uh, very quickly to form uh, in the councils um, ad hoc alliances. We did that at the time when the question was about the rules of the funding of uh, framework uh, programs. Uh, we had a couple of common interests and the minister, ministers can come together. But I think the point still is, um, or the, the opportunity still is mostly, you know, not just, not just to respond, but uh, try to drive the agenda. As I said, in the terms, in the direction of the internet, as it once was to, uh, to borrow from a, from a commercial, from, from Croatian tourism. So let me um, back up a little bit. I think we've really uh, outlined uh, some of the kind of political implications of the report, which is great, but we're now facing a second COVID crisis. And I'm going to ask Rimantas, uh, Minister Zilas, to respond to this first, but others can, uh, if the other two want to pipe in, I'd welcome that. Um, we have a question from Kinga Brzezinska. Uh, she is asking about what policymakers should do differently in light of COVID-19. It strikes me we, in the report, talk about COVID-19 as, as almost, a, I don't want to say a positive thing, but something that spurred more uh, development of uh, digital and more awareness of the importance of digital policy in the region. Now, many countries in the region are looking at either second lockdowns or certainly rising uh, case numbers. Are there lessons from the last time round in the spring? Or is this different? Is this the right time to be talking about these issues 
uh, in terms of growth and uh, digital policy. And Minister Gilles, and if others have comments, let's move on. Yeah, thank you for questions uh, coming uh, tougher and tougher, I would say. Uh, and uh, from what I see, the, uh, uh, there will be no very good time for talking about some specific things. But so it's always the time. And in a way, this COVID crisis gives us opportunity because it gives us very strong needs. In a, uh, in a face of this crisis, what we need to understand really is, for example, how countries are responding and what in, a, uh, in on the one way they are responding in the medical sphere, kind of in the healthcare sphere, but on the other hand, they are responding with the, a lot of measures in the economic sphere. But how they are doing, we are finding out very late in the process. I mean, we, when statistics departments come in with their post factum uh, evaluations about what's going on. So in this, in this period of crisis, there's a huge increased need for real time, basically, information. And to my understanding, as we talk about in the report as well, we talk about importance of open data, of data sharing uh, for building up our digital economies. I think this COVID crisis gives us really opportunity to address this problem, kind of. So are we able to open up our data about healthcare situation and so on? so that we can share, we can compare, because now comparison, what you see in the uh, World Health Organization is very, again, uh, quite post factum and very aggregated. But can we do it in a more actionable way? That's a big, uh, big question, because what we, for example, what we have in Lithuania, we have a huge systems that can present a views on how every, uh, you know, about our uh, companies, how they are doing, how their revenue performances uh, are and so on, as well as healthcare information on this regard. So to my understanding, one of the policies that can be what we can leverage in this time of crisis really to build a cooperation platform about, so can we open up comparable data share it in a very uh, real-time fashion so that we can help not only synchronize policies because probably this is not so important at this stage but help to learn about what we are doing and how it's going in uh, in comparison not by just telling but by showing data thank you um let me go to minister Passi and ask about her reaction what opportunities or challenges the new wave of COVID-19 may present. Let me also ask you, though, um, we spent a lot of time in the task force talking about education. And uh, everyone here has mentioned, I think, the very strong STEM capabilities, science, technology, engineering, math um, tech, um, capabilities in Central Europe but didn't regard that as sufficient. And I wondered if you could, we had a number of recommendations about hubs at universities and things like that. And I wondered if you could speak to some of the uh, educational elements that we talked to. But first, are there opportunities in this new, in this COVID uh, upswing that unfortunately we are seeing? Uh, yes, there is, uh, there are a lot of, problematic sides from all this uh, COVID second wave. And what we can see is that we have actually not drawn all the lessons from the first wave, wave of, the, of the pandemic when our countries uh, uh, have been pra praised for, for, for dealing quite, quite successfully with the, with the pandemic. Um, but um, uh, at the same time, there is always a positive side, and it is very, very visible in the in the topic we are discussing now. Because uh, the start of this uh, 
COVID-19 pandemic um, actually provoked a very dramatic increase in, in digital engagement in our societies. And that's a, that's a positive side. Um, if, we, if we see millions of new uh, online services, service users only in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, well, that, that sends, I believe, a very clear message to the policy uh, makers. Um, we see that online access to governmental services has more than doubled in our region. So it creates a really uh, a huge new need uh, for, for decision makers to take actions. But at the same time, what bothers me uh, also as a, as a, a consequence out of this uh, pandemic and, and the mere fact that we were forced to switch to online uh, education, health service, uh, et cetera, et cetera, was that it sort of revealed uh, pending inequalities uh, in our societies. And I think they need to be addressed uh, in a very urgent matter. Uh, we, we thought that we would never again face closure of the educational system, but we are back here discussing should we close the schools or not. And then as a parent, as a person who has three kids at school, I'm starting questioning myself how those kids in the urban areas of Bulgaria would survive if they don't have the access to internet that my family does. And that's a really, really very, very uh, important question, uh, as well as all the different signs of inequality that, that have been uh, um, revealed uh, during this, uh, this pandemic. Then going to your question on education, that's very, very close to my heart. And in my uh, how to see um, non-governmental capacity, I try to invest as much time as possible to to uh, deal with this, uh, uh, with this topic. Uh, one of my NGOs, the Digital National Alliance, is, is working uh, very actively with teachers, with kids, because what we see is that we need a comprehensive approach here, uh, where all the, the stakeholders should be involved, because uh, we are not talking about basic digital skills anymore. We are talking about a demand for technology skills uh, that, according to many experts, will double by 2030. So we might face uh, a really uh, unskilled uh, population, which would further um, keep our countries behind. And that's very important. And I'm very happy to see a specific chapter in the report dealing with this, with this topic, because uh, in general, we should not invent the wheel here. Let us simply look at countries who have done much better their jobs. Let us see what the United States is doing, at least uh, where you are succeeding. Let us see what the Nordic countries are doing. Let us see how Estonia is doing. And just try to introduce uh, these good practices here in Bulgaria. I'm very happy to see the recommendation for establishing uh, the regional hubs of innovation, but also for establishing digital schools towards the uni uh, uh, attached to the university in each of the countries in our region. And I would very much encourage the Atlantic Council to not put a full stop after this report is released, but try and dig into it and see how we can best, you know, share good practices and move things forward which at the end of the day will make us stronger after the pandemic, not vice versa. So thank you very much for that. Um, I want to turn now to Mr. Turk. We've had a couple of questions, one from Ian Brzezinski and one from uh, Tiomar Storchev, about uh, who uh, I believe is the uh, Bulgarian ambassador in, in Washington, if it's the right Tiomar Storchev. Um, and they have asked about uh, commercially viable projects, and they have asked about what are actually cross-border um, projects that we would uh, serve as examples, and mentioned as well the creation of infrastructure in much of Central Europe. And we've had a number of discussions in the task force about data centers in Bulgaria, about cloud services and, and cloud providers. And I wonder if you could speak a bit about the types of projects that we see. We did in the 
in the task force decide not to identify project A, B, and C that we knew specifically was going on, but to talk about the types of projects that could be good for the uh, for the countries to look at the region to look at either in sub regional clusters or across the whole region. And I wondered if you could say a few words about that. And of course, if you want to pick up on some of the particularly the educational issues that were framed before that's also welcome. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, as I said in the beginning, um, digital is a little bit more tricky for regional cooperation than are, for example, I don't know, railways or roads or, or something tangible where it's really useful that things are nearby. Um, clearly, I think there are opportunities for cooperation where these countries see eye to eye in, um, uh, in a certain areas where they would develop things together. There's possibility to learn from each other, but it's also a possibility to learn from, from Scandinavia or Germany or France or, or uh, Portugal or, uh, or whoever. There have been calculations that um, given the energy prices and given the prices of, of human labor, uh, some of the cloud services could actually be quite um, attractive um, in this part of the world. Um, indeed, this, this calls for cross-border networks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I think some of that stuff is uh, in the making already. Um, touching upon education, um, it's, um, I think we will see a lot more online distance learning um, after COVID um, than we did before. Maybe some, maybe a lot of education will simply not return to impersonal format. Um, and we could uh, envision, you know, common programs, um, uh, joint degrees, etc., uh, across the regions, across the region, but also across Europe. I don't think we should uh, limit ourselves just to the region. We have a, um, um, a joint degree between three universities in Europe. Uh, one is in Porto, Portugal. The other is in Milan, Italy, and University of Ljubljana. And we are doing some uh, some of the digital stuff, digital learning, uh, in that respect. Um, so. Um, I think, and this is what the report calls for, um, in this group, yes, we did not have the exact idea what these common projects should be for, but we said a small fraction of the recovery fund should be dedicated to establishing a network of government representatives that would get together and think of how to use synergies of this recovery fund uh, in the sphere of digital. Um, to go back to the education, I think STEM is fine uh, all across the region. Um, what is maybe not so fine is the education that would create out of all these brilliant STEM engineers, entrepreneurs. Um, this may not be just the issue of education, it could also be the issue of culture uh, in many countries. Um, and last but not least, about the impact of, uh, of COVID. Uh, it exposed a lot of strengths in the countries, especially in spring when uh, everything was a surprise um, in some areas and some countries um, actually um, demonstrated resilience, they demonstrated uh, resourcefulness, uh, how to handle things. It showed that a lot of solutions can be created uh, in an improvised way. For example, our schools, there was no like a central system, so how do you go, go online? schools individually, often teachers individually, uh, found solutions. Uh, but one thing that perhaps as Europeans, as Westerns, in fact, we should um, reconsider our policy uh, is how to use technology to actually stop the virus. And here, I think being too um, dogmatic about the GDPR and human rights and all that, and taking some, um, you know, taking a few pages out of the Chinese playbook might actually save lives. And um, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's important to be able to adapt uh, in this and maybe revisit some of these applications and some of the technology that we are using. We could do together with Google and Apple who provided some of the core uh, framework for this, 
um, we could get much more information out of that and the apps could be much more useful. We should uh, let the technology help fight COVID. So let me um, also go back now to Ramantis Gilles. Thank you for that. And I think that the last bit is especially prescient in talking about the balance between Central Europe and, and Brussels. Um, but Ramantis, I'd like to ask um, what more these this region could look for from Brussels and how more it could react with Brussels. And I'd also like um, some comments from the panel. We're coming close to the end. Some comments from the panel on the uh, geopolitical implications of what we're talking about here. Um, we are seeing um, efforts by actors outside the transatlantic sphere uh, certainly, we here in the United States are, are thinking about our election and election disinformation and things like that. But the, we came back repeatedly uh, in the task force to the issue of standards and the importance of, of developing standards across the Atlantic. And I wish each of you would kind of identify one or two things that Central Europe should be doing internally, externally. Uh, to advance greater European cohesion and, and transatlantic cohesion in these issues. And let me start with Rimantis and then come back to Ziga and then Gergana. Yeah, I see questions are not getting any easier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, just finishing maybe with these uh, uh, projects, Overall, I would as well uh, pinpoint that huge needs that are uh, building up with the specifically in the energy sector or in the governmental sector and so on, they can be, uh, they, these are very specifically good projects for region to advance on. It's not that let's build a data center, but let's solve the problems because data centers are only the means of solving something okay. or artificial intelligence as such is just another mean of doing something. And we need genuine problems that would be solved. And I think this both COVID crisis, as uh, Mr. Uh, Minister Giga mentioned, and uh, energy solutions are kind of these problems where a lot of effort can be uh, focused and in incentivized uh, new technologies and opportunities. And what comes to uh, and this? Remember, yeah. I have to ask you to be brief because they we're closer yes, to the yeah. thing hour than I thought. Um, yeah. So uh, coming to the uh, transatlantic things overall, probably what we uh, already was briefly mentioned uh, uh, around the sovereignty, digital sovereignty things what we what i hear a lot in lithuania we are really about having a like-minded sovereignty rather than european sovereignty as such so we do not want to treat uh, this i mean transatlantic community has to be treated as a one like-minded uh, sovereignty thing i'm not very sure how much lithuania as you say as the single country can do about it but this is the thing that we kind of uh, overall, I feel that there's a general feeling about it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Minister Turk? Yeah, um, I remember the a joke that somebody mentioned at this reflection group of the on the future of Europe that Felipe Gonzalez was chairing and I was secretary general of. And that person said that um, a problem with, uh, you know, um, with European Union is that it is led by former superpowers. And these former superpowers sometimes, sometimes still think they are superpower and they have to behave like a superpower or think that Europe is a superpower, which uh, probably is not the case. Europe should be autonomous, but we should work closely together in a transatlantic partnership uh, in order that the two of us together, the two pillars of this kind of Western uh, culture, uh, can um, 
get the world to, to, to develop into the direction that uh, we feel is the, is the right one. And that goes for digital and that goes for many other things as well. And finally, let me turn to Minister Passi and let me also ask her, since Bulgaria will be uh, chairing the three C's, whether she has any expectations for digital in the three C's over the coming year. Uh, well, I think with joint efforts, we might work so that uh, uh, we, we go beyond our expectations. I must say that at the moment I see the 3C initiatives uh, since its very start, but also in the recent months, and in particular in Bulgaria, being much more active in uh, topics like transport and energy. Uh, for example, the, the money that Bulgaria has committed uh, and the project it, it has submitted are only related to infrastructure and that's something disappointing to me. I would very much want to see a uh, renewed understanding of the importance of digital and probably uh, this report might also uh, give food for thought uh, for um, strengthening the digital peer, pillar in the, uh, in the three C's initiatives. I believe Bulgaria uh, as a country hosting the initiatives in the next couple of months will be active in seeking a more consolidation of the, of the initiative as well as why not expanding its borders. For example, it is, it's been discussed here that countries like Greece and Cyprus, although not becoming a full-fledged members, might have a much more visible role in the initiative and I think this should be encouraged. Um, uh, so, um, I would like to see the Atlantic Council continuing these efforts and not stopping only with issuing this report, but going further and giving even more detailed, uh, you know, ideas, recommendations, how we can move things forward. And then last, last point um, uh, as, uh, as an answer to your previous questions, our countries, I believe, have the have the historic credibility uh, to really invest efforts in, uh, um, in um, developing practical solutions, uh, practical agreements for one of the most important issues, including mm. the rollout of 5G, which is very, very topical uh, nowadays. But we should, um, and I don't mind also leading the process for for, for, for writing down the proper security standards for this. But we should also bear in mind that moving away from the so-called risky or high-risk vendors towards more secure, but also more expensive alternatives comes at a cost. And we should take care that our telecoms do not uh, uh, get out of the game just because they have to completely transform their infrastructure and switch to a more secure but also more more um, expensive one. Uh, therefore, I think 5G might come out as one of the priorities during the mm -hmm. Bulgarian presidency, along with topics like uh, like um, uh, HPC, high performing computers, where Bulgaria really takes pride in because we have one of the fastest computers um, in, in, in Europe on Bulgarian territory. And along with data centers, um, although I agree they don't solve the problem in itself, but it also gives a completely new attitude towards uh, using the free flow of data for the purpose of um, really servicing our citizens. Thank you, thanks very much. And uh, let me, provide assurances that this is this report is not the end of the effort at the Atlantic Council. We're looking forward to working with all our task force members, as well as many others, to see how we can best advance this agenda and uh, what next might be concrete steps, whether roundtables or further discussions, et cetera. And certainly look forward to continuing to work with our excellent group of task force members. Let me conclude this session by first off thanking the audience for joining us and for your good questions. Let me thank all our task force members and our co-chairs, Paula Dobriansky and Maciej Wytutski, and especially the three task force members, ministers Turk, Pasi, and Gilas, who have joined us today. And a final special thanks to uh, Jorn Fleck and Eileen Kanengeiser for their Herculean efforts in getting all these good ideas together 
in what I think is an excellent report. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.